Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Our webinar is beginning. My name is Steve Love. I'm President and CEO of the Dallas-Fort Worth Hospital Council, and we want to thank all of you for being here today for this educational webinar, and it's hosted in coordination with PYAPC, and they're an associate member of the Hospital Council. PYA was built on the principles of outstanding client service, giving exceptional advice. Since 1983, PYA has consistently ranked among the top 20 healthcare consulting firms in the United States and is a top 15 auditor of the nation's largest health systems. Our topic today is federal legislative and regulatory update, and hospitals have obviously spent the last four months or five months focused on COVID-19, but we can't forget the other issues that we must prepare for as we look towards next year and the events of 2021. This session is going to address many of these concerns. They're going to include appropriate use criteria, transparency, site neutral payments, the future of the Medicare Trust Fund, and the overall federal budget. We're delighted our speaker today is Kathy Reap, and Kathy is a senior manager at PYA. She has had more than three decades of experience in healthcare, much expertise in compliance, financial advisory work, reimbursement, managed care, and revenue cycle work. Kathy has helped clients with Medicare, Medicaid, workers' comp, reimbursement, and many other complex programs and issues. Prior to being with PYA, I had the honor of having Kathy, when she was with the Florida Hospital Association, actually come here to the DFW Hospital Council, and she presented a program at that time on recovery audit contractors when they were first coming out, and she did an excellent presentation. So we know her presentation today is going to be equally important, equally informative, and we hope that you will listen and ask good questions. And so it's my pleasure to now turn this over to Kathy, Ms. Kathy Reap. Thanks, Steve. I really appreciate that kind introduction. And I really wish that we were actually doing this in person, like we were able to do the with the recovery audit contractors. However, um, I guess COVID all has managed to get in, into in the way of a lot of things. But I also, by the time we're done with this, you can't really do a legislative and regulatory update and share a lot of good news. So it's kind of like doing the RAC presentation. Um, I don't want y'all to throw things at me and, and that you are watching from either your home or um, your office. Um, it's going to be harder for you to get me this way. So let's kind of, Steve gave you an idea of the different things that we're going to touch on. So let's just go ahead and begin. Um, the first area that I really wanted to talk about actually goes back to earlier this year, but I guess I would say missed in all of the hubbub of COVID, but we did get the president's budget proposals for 2021. The reason this issue is important now is because we have to have a budget. We need, we will probably have a continuing resolution, maybe even as early as um, Friday or early next week to keep the, um, government open, we literally, we've got to have something by um, October 1st, but that would just be a continuing resolution. It merely keeps us open, kind of keeps the status quo, but what are the things that have actually been looked at that would impact hospitals from a budget perspective and that could actually come into play in 2021? Just walk through, first of all, when we start talking about the administration's budget and what the um, president submits every year to Congress, um, you need to recognize that what the president submits is non-binding, um, but it almost becomes, I want to say, a Chinese menu 
uh, pick one from column A and one from column B. The reason I say that is we have this monstrous list of things that will reduce spending um, that is pre presented by the administration. And then all of a sudden, let's say we want to increase funding for a particular item. Well, how do we pay for it? Oh, here's a list of things to choose from. So we need to pay attention to the president's budget proposal because this is presented to Congress with dollars attached to it. And then all of a sudden, when they need to pay for another item, and before we're done today, we're gonna to talk about some of those things they need to pay for. Um, it's kind of a good idea to um, know what they, what are the possibilities. So let's just kind of walk through a few of the things that were included in the administration's budget. The first section that I have here related to Medicare. Currently, you know that um, under Medicare reimbursement, you get reimbursed 65% uh, of your Medicare bad debts reported on the cost report. They reimburse you a portion of that. They are the president's budget includes a proposal to reduce your reimbursement from 65% of um, what is reported to 25%. Well, I can picture people who are saying he might not get reelected, this will go away. No, this particular provision has been there for several presidents. This whole option of reducing Medicare reimb reimbursement, actually I should say for several administrations, uh, because it was there under the Obama-Biden administration uh, to reduce your reimbursement for Medicare bad debt. So it's not likely to go away, and it is a, an item that provides significant revenue back into um, the federal government. There is also discussion of Medicare disproportionate share payments. These are the payments you receive for providing care to a large number of low-income patients. Um, and to actually remove disproportionate share from linking it to Medicare payments, index it to inflation, and just pay lump sums to providers as opposed to tying it into a per case payment amount. An area that I'm going to, I've actually been spending considerable time on lately, um, relates to post-acute care. Because some of you might say, well, I'm a psych hospital or rehab, none of this applies to me. Um, but if you are psych, if you are uh, long-term acute, skilled nursing, home health, um, uh, rehab, CMS is looking at developing a unified post-acute care payment system. This was called for under the Impact Act uh, several years ago. That was passed, and the idea is to develop a single payment methodology for post-acute care. Um, the, the facilities that would tend to lose under that would be the long-term acute care hospitals and the inpatient rehab facilities. Your SNFs and home health agencies would probably come out um, with higher reimbursement. Um, once they um, develop a single program. Um, they are also looking at for the um, requirement currently for long-term acute care hospitals to, for patients who are transferred to LTATs to have been in an acute care stay in the ICU for, for at least three days. They're proposing to raise that to eight. That has a significant impact on your length of stay for patients who wind up having to stay in your acute care hospital in order to be acceptable for transfer to LTAC and for that LTAC to receive its full level of reimbursement. Um, one area that we are very concerned about is site neutral, and this is lowering those payment rates provided in hospital clinic settings or hospital outpatient settings to equal those um, within a physician, uh, physician's office. Um, we currently have that requirement um, under outpatient PPS, but um, we have a limitation related to um, reducing the payment rates only for those services that are provided off campus. Well, the president's proposal would actually pay a reduced rate for services 
provided both on campus and off campus, particularly clinic visit services, lowering them down to the physician rate. Um, right now, again, that is only for off campus um, clinic visits. This would be expanding it to even those services provided in your hospital. Uh, also, value based purchasing, paying for, for value. Um, they are proposing that there be a value-based purchasing program uh, developed for both outpatient services and for ambulatory surgical centers. Um, until you have the details of how this would work, it just makes you nervous because you don't know how you perform compared to all of the ho other hospitals in the country. But I also, in the back of my mind, say it would be very interesting to see um, the quality outcomes within an ambulatory surgical setting and pay, uh, pay um, them based upon the value of the care provided. Under the Medicaid program, when they start looking at proposals for Medicaid, um, a, something that we are already dealing with in some cases, um, well, I guess every case, there is a um, Increased copayment on Medicare patients, on Medicaid patients who um, use the emergency room for non-emergency services. Well, they are suggesting that this be increased. My gut feel of it with this particular provision is if you, uh, if they move to require states to incre increase the amount that the patient would pay for non-emergency use of the ED, that pretty much just says the hospital will have an increased write-off uh, because it is very difficult to get a patient who qualifies for Medicaid to pay um, an outpatient copayment um, oblig obligation. Uh, it's something that we have seen during this administration um, that has caused concern um, relates to um, limiting Medicaid qualifications to um, those individuals who um, have a green card who are considered um, within the appropriate um, level for immigration um, and that there would be a requirement to increase the documentation requirements for immigration status prior to approval for Medicaid. Um, Again, another item we've heard during this administration is a work requirement. Um, this, would, this is in the budget again. And um, a limitation on public hospitals that would limit their Medicaid reimbursement to the, uh, the cost of providing care, would not give them anything above actual cost of care. So that just gives you an idea of some of the Medicare and Medicaid provisions that the administration included in their budget proposal. We just need to be concerned what carries through. Um, and um, even from one administration to the next, if there is a change in 2021, what will Biden's um, budget proposals be um, in terms of um, reducing overall spending under the Medicare and Medicaid programs? We're going to keep going through this, and then we're going to do questions at the end. So I kind of wanted to touch on the Medicare Trust Fund because um, I'm getting older and I, am, I have always been concerned about the Trust Fund, but years ago I wasn't nearly as concerned as I am now. And I would say I last year I was not as concerned about the Trust Fund as I am today and we'll talk about why. So let's kind of look at this from a Medicare Trust Fund perspective. Kind of hidden in all of the um, COVID issues was the fact that in April, the, um, the hospital insurance trust fund, the trustees, issued their annual report on the status of the trust fund. The main thing that was covered in the media, although it wasn't very much, was the fact that um, they said that the trust fund would be exhausted in 2026. And that was the same thing that they had said in 2020, 2019, was that we were looking at a 2026 um, expiration date or exhaustion date for the Medicare Trust Fund. 
Um, the trustees report essentially said that the income for the Medicare program um, would be, uh, the, for the trust fund, would be only sufficient enough to pay 90% of scheduled benefits. Um, we screamed, we fought, we are concerned about it coming back, see frustration. That was a 2% reduction in your Medicare reimbursement. Now what we would be looking at is a 10% reduction in your reimbursement. Um, and that does get very concerning in terms of the future of the trust fund. But now let's look at what happened and the breaking news just a week after the trust fund report was issued. And this was a great article, I thought, in Modern Healthcare. It was also picked up in um, Politico. But they talked about the elephant in the room um, and the fact that COVID was going to probably have a negative effect on the reserve funds of both Medicare and Social Security. Um, based upon the most recent analysis of the impact of COVID, it's recognized that spending did go up and we had fewer dollars paid into the trust fund. Remember the dollars that are paid into the Medicare Part A trust fund, essentially it's that 2.9% um, um, payroll tax, 1.45 paid by the employee, 1.45 by the employer, that goes to fund the Medicare Trust Fund. Um, however, we had a large number of people who became unemployed, and therefore that has a negative consequence on the dollars that are in the trust fund. We are now looking at a date. This is about uh, the, the trustees report came out early April. This was late April, um, but the report is now saying we're probably looking at something closer to 2023. Now we will have a trust, uh, trust fund report that comes out early next year. Um, very concerning in terms of where that's going to take us and what it's going to say in terms of the future of the Medicare trust fund. Um, and they, in one of the articles, it did say that it's too early to say what the impacts are going to be of this uh, pandemic, but they are generally going to be worse than presented under the intermediate assumptions in this report. So remember, the intermediate assumption was paying out at 90%, um, and they're saying it could be worse. worse. Um, there was actually some discussion um, by the uh, trustees saying that once we weigh in all of the implications of the increased costs of care and decreased payroll tax revenues coming in, quote unquote, the situation will go from bad to worse. And what does it mean when we say that the Medicare trust fund is exhausted? Um, this is actually from the trustees report. And it says that if assets were depleted, Medicare could pay health plans and providers, because remember the health plans are paid through this trust fund as well, only to the extent allowed by ongoing tax revenues. And these revenues would be inadequate to fully cover costs. So they're going to pay you less, but they're also going to probably delay payment because you've got to allow money to come into the trust fund. Um, I was one, I am on a credit union board many years ago, we were struggling as a credit union and we could only make loans to the extent that deposits came in. So when we had a, um, a long period between um, payroll, um, we would often have weeks that we could not make loans. We could approve loans, but we couldn't fund them. This is what would be going on with the Medicare program, and that you can submit your claim, they will approve payment of your claim, but it would be slowed and being paid based upon tax revenues coming in. Um, in order, this and this year's report, they essentially said for the trust fund to remain solvent through the 75 year projection period, because they do try to project for 75 years, the 2.9% payroll tax would have to be immediately increased 
um, by to 3.81 percent. So that would be an increase on you as an employee and on your employer, or reduce spending by 19 percent. So we were looking at a 10 percent reduction in spending. They are now spending what will be closer to 19 percent. So I don't want to be doom and gloom, but that is my nickname. Um, so just letting you know that we need to pay very close attention to the trust fund, what comes out next year in the projections, and also as we start looking at, um, at legislation to perhaps address um, the trust fund going forward. Let's move on to transparency. I think some of you probably participated in a webinar that I did recently with Chris Kinney from King and Spalding on transparency, but I want to do this as a refresher and perhaps there are some who did not, um, were not able to participate in that earlier webinar. But essentially this is a rule that um, came out um, this, well, November of last year, it was final. And there are two parts essentially to the requirements for um, providers. First of all, there's a requirement that um, you post your charge data in a single machine readable file. Um, when I say machine readable, this is not a PDF file. This is going to be um, either an Excel, um, a, a CSV or JSON file. Um, there can be no barrier to an individual accessing this information. It is fully available and readily on your website. Um, no password required, no patient account number required, anything like that. And there is a requirement that you then uh, report, right now you have a requirement that your charge master is posted. Um, and it would show your charge item and your charge, your standard charge, your gross charge. Well, CMS is modifying this to say that both your actual charge and payer, payer negotiated charges would have to be posted. Well, I know that you don't negotiate charges with a payer, you negotiate rates. But CMS uses the term charge and rates interchangeably. So they have identified five types of quote unquote standard charges that you would have to post on this machine readable file for each item in your charge master. Um, the first type of um, file that you would have to post, I'm going to jump back to that slide in a minute, um, is your gross charge. That's really what you already have out on your website that was required as of January of last year. Then they also want to have for each of your payers with whom you have a contract, um, your payer-specific negotiated rate. So let's say you have three contracts, one with Aetna, one with United, one with Blue Cross. You would have, in addition to your gross charge, you'd have three more columns that would give your payer-specific negotiated rate for those items that you negotiate rates on uh, listed. Um, you would then look at those three columns and you would say who's the highest, who's the lowest, and you would report out a de-identified minimum rate and a de-identified maximum. I'm not telling you that it's Aetna who has the highest um, negotiated rate, but I am putting that amount there. Same thing for the minimum. And then finally, you would be required to report uh, your discounted cash price. This is not the price associated with individuals who qualify for assistance under the financial assistance program. But if I walked in, said I am self-pay, I would like to pay cash, what are you going to charge me? Uh, that information would have to be included on your um, this monstrous um, machine readable file. You would also, of course, have to have a description of the item or service, and this has to be something easily understood by the consumer. And then any other codes that you use for accounting or billing purposes, this perhaps could be a fix fix code, a national drug code, a revenue code, whatever it might be, that would need to be reported um, on this monstrous spreadsheet. Um, this spreadsheet would have to be updated at least annually, 
and somewhere on the document you would have to show the date of the last update. Um, and if you have multiple locations, perhaps a campus that is strictly outpatient and you have different rates there than outpatient services provided in your, um, within your main hospital campus, um, you would have to post this for each hospital location. Um, you also have to include um, any physician services if you employ your physicians and their, their charges, their rates are a part of your charge master. Thank you, CMS. Although we argued back and forth that we don't think this is useful information um, for the consumer, it's not what the consumer cares about. They don't want to know what kind of a rate you have negotiated with Aetna for um, um, a gauze bandage. Um, what happens is that this is information that CMS believes will be used by employers, other providers, pool developers, and I would say specifically payers because this makes it readily apparent to payers what they have negotiated for an MRI compared to what someone else. And when I gave that example of this spreadsheet and I only gave you three payers, um, Blue Cross, Aetna, and United, I believe, what you wind up with is many of you have huge numbers of contacts. Um, we we're working with a client recently who has 161 contacts. Think about this monstrous document that you are developing that needs to be um, posted at, in a machine readable file on your website, readily accessible. This just gives an idea as to CMS's graphic on what this would look like. Um, you can see that CMS's footnotes here says we only went so far as to say, as to provide information on reporting your gross charge. Um, hospitals must also make public the payer specific negotiated charge, the de identified minimum, the de identified maximum, and the discounted cash price for all items and services. So they have made this look easy. It is not easy when you start adding all of those other columns for all of your various payers to this document. The one thing I think we have to be thankful for is CMS has said this is a machine readable file. This is a file that is readily accessible. Um, in the proposed rule, they said you needed to have it available hard copy. Um, we need to be thankful that they eliminated that requirement because this would be a very difficult tool to make available in a hard copy format um, with all of the various contracts that you um, as a provider have negotiated. The second part of this requirement is that you have a display, again, in a format that is easily searchable, consumer friendly, for up to 300 shoppable services or bundles. Um, you're going to have to show the um, uh, standard charges for this, um, where you're actually going in and saying, here is my actual charge, here is my, um, my negotiated rate with Aetna, with Blue Cross, et cetera. These are shoppable services. These are things that a consumer is going to look for. How much does this hospital charge for this? And golly gee, what have they negotiated with Aetna versus another payer um, for payment? Um, CMS has given you a list of 70 of those 300 services. If you don't provide one of the 70, then you've got to come up with 230, um, 230 one services um, so that you have a, uh, a total of 30, um, 300 rather, a total of 300. Now, if um, you don't provide 300 different shoppable services, then obviously your number would be low. But these are services unique to you that the consumers would shop for. This isn't going to be what you charge for level five in, in, in the emergency department. Um, because they don't shop for that. They shop for things like um, vaginal deliveries, um, C-sections, things like that. Um, so you would have your, your, your um, services 
at a bundled level posted. Um, again, no barriers to access, update that information at least annually. And this is, again, CMS's um, interpretation of what this would look like. Uh, again, they are only showing for one particular plan. This would need to go um, much broader and show the various plans. Um, using the example of an office visit, a uh, new patient out, uh, outpatient visit for 30 minutes, we've given you the CPT code for that. Um, and your uh, standard charge for plan X. You can see both for the colonoscopy and the vaginal delivery, uh, it's noted that you do, not, you do not provide the physician services, the general anesthesia service, although you might provide the anesthesia itself, or you would provide that. Um, I think it is a good idea to follow CMS's um, picture here. Uh, in terms of saying not provided by the hospital, maybe billed separately, so that when a, a patient or a consumer is comparing your hospital to someone else, um, and someone else looks significantly higher, um, theirs might include physician services for yours does not, and you don't want to surprise a patient by um, suddenly um, them getting a physician bill or multiple physician bills when you have said, this is what we think the price is. There is an alternative that was made available by CMS to the shoppable services, and this is to actually have a price estimator tool. Um, this is, rather than doing the, um, um, what, what does Aetna pay, what does Blue Cross pay, et cetera, this actually allows the patient to go in and say, I'm Mary Smith, this, I have Aetna, and this is my, um, my um, member number. And what you're going to come up with is if Mary Smith is going to have a um, outpatient E&M visit to show what is Mary going to owe, not what, the plan is going to pay you, but what, or the total amount that you've contracted for, but what does Mary know? And this is actually, in my opinion, a better way to go because you do want to be able to help the consumer know what they're going to owe you for a service as opposed to tell everyone what a payer is going to pay you. You still have to have that machine readable file. Um, but I don't know that the consumer is going to be as focused on that as they are going to be focused on what am I going to owe XYZ hospital if I go there uh, compared to what will I owe another hospital uh, at, um, under my contract. And this is how the consumer is going to help get uh, better information about um, uh, in-network, out-of-network providers, et cetera. Um, but this is what the patient really wants. So if you have not moved forward with uh, becoming compliant with this rule, the compliance date is January 1, 2021, um, then you do need to start spending some time looking at how you're going to do this. And I urge you to think about making a price estimator tool available um, as opposed to just that listing of shoppable services. Um, let's move forward with some proposed and final rules for 2021, just to make sure that you know what else is on the horizon. Um, we do have a final rule for the inpatient prospective payment system. Um, we are seeing an increase of about 2.9% in the payment rate, going up from about $5,800 to um, closer to $6,000 as your base rate. I think you are all aware that your, um, your base rate has been multiplied times the weight of an individual DRG. All of that has been adjusted by, that base rate adjusted by your area wage index, come up with your payment rate under the Medicare system. There were some changes um, under the uh, wage index um, uh, system. Um, there were a number of markets that have been redefined from urban to rural, rural to urban, um, just modifying markets. And I believe that there are some in the Dallas-Fort Worth area 
that again are finding themselves moved from one um, urban rural to the other way around. So they are implementing um, with a, um, oh, I guess a two year phase in, essentially limiting an individual hospital's loss because of a wage index of 5% um, for 2021 and then full implementation in 2022. Um, there is a new DRG that has been established for Part T, um, the cell therapy service. Um, the payment rate for Part T has an extremely high weight. I think the overall payment comes out to somewhere close to $240,000 for that individual DRG. However, I also have heard that um, some of the providers who provide that service um, are not as, um, they wish it were higher, I guess I should say. Um, there was a provision uh, in the final rule that is going to, in order to distribute Medicare disproportionate share dollars, um, they are going to use a single year, fiscal year 2017, of the worksheet S10 to your Medicare cost report to determine uncompensated care. Um, the one thing that I think is positive about the final rule related to Medicare disproportionate share. Um, they had orig originally proposed because of the significant increase in the number of people who had insurance, um, they had uh, proposed to reduce the dollars that would be distributed under Medicare disproportionate share by $534 million. Um, and therefore it many more hospitals would lose reimbursement under DISH. Um, a lot of great comment letters were submitted by hospitals and their associations um, on this proposed rule arguing COVID and the fact that as a result of COVID, we suddenly have many people unemployed and therefore having lost insurance, the number of uncompensated care patients that you were seeing was going up. And to base this year's pool on data that was several years old was inappropriate. Um, and therefore CMS did revisit this issue and they only reduced the um, disproportionate share pool by $60 million um, compared to where it was in uh, this, this current fiscal year. Um, so that is a huge shift from the $534 million reduction that they had proposed. Um, there was also a good deal of discussion in the inpatient rule related to Medicare bad debt. Um, they have gone forward with most of the things that they proposed. Um, the slides give you an idea as to what we were looking at. First of all, a similar collection effort between Medicare and non-Medicare accounts with like amounts. You can't claim a bad debt while it's pending at a collection agency. And this next particular provision is one that I am concerned about because I think it does change the way you deal with the issue of indigency. Um, you can no longer rely on a signed declaration by the patient that they do not have income or that they're low income. Um, you're going to have to do independent verification of the patient's claim. Um, they had proposed to require you to look at income, assets, expenses, and liabilities. Um, that would have been a nightmare. Um, they have come out in the final rule to say that you only need to look at income and assets. I think that is hard enough because does that mean you are going to be asking a patient not only about their income, but also um, what they have in the bank? Um, their retirement, the value of their house, do they have a car that could be refinanced, things like that. I do not envy anyone in the business office having to ask those questions of a patient who can't pay their bill. So um, I, it's something that really concerns me and this is effective October 1. So I do think it's something that you need to start definitely paying attention to and looking at your processes within the business office. Um, just concerning when we can no longer rely on the patient saying, I can't pay, and we have to do more in-depth verification. 
and we look at this as a staffing issue. Do you have the staff to do that independent verification as well? Um, uh, there were some other um, bad debt revisions. Um, the one that I am most concerned about, um, we know that we have to send the patient, um, we have to bill them uh, no later than 120 days after the remit. Then as has clarified that that is the later, later remit, either the Medicare remit or that from the secondary payer, not necessarily 120 days from the Medicare remit, but now it is 120 days from the latest remit that you get. So that's probably gonna be the secondary payer. Um, but the one that really bothers me is that in terms of writing off the bad debt, your 120 day or 121 day period resets after each partial payment. So you have a Medicare patient who owes you a um, thousand dollars and they send you ten dollars that reset their 120 day 121 day period you, can, you have to wait it can be no you have to wait 121 days after issuing the bill before you can write it off um, I honestly and again um, y'all will get to know me but I am sometimes too negative about this stuff but I don't know of a lot that's positive um, when we're dealing with Medicare regulations, but I pictured um, the little newsletter that comes out from AARP telling seniors when they need to uh, look at their budget and have trouble paying all of their bills, you only need to pay a partial payment to a hospital um, every uh, 90 to 115 days because then they're going to have to keep carrying you. I just picture that coming out, and I do think when it does, uh, I'm going to frame it. Um, but I, I am concerned about the clock resetting every time the patient makes the payment. And it's not a, um, there's no requirement that they make a um, rational payment, but as soon as they make a payment, the clock resets. Um, also, we talked about transparency, but I want to let you know that there was a, a new transparency provision included in the um, uh, inpatient rule uh, that has been finalized. Essentially, uh, adding to your Medicare cost report will be a requirement that for every MSDRG, um, you come up with a median. This would be across all of your Medicare Advantage payers. Um, a median payer-specific negotiated inpatient service charge. So I'm going to look at all of all of my rates that were calculated for a particular MSDRG. I'm going to come up with the median, and I am going to include this in my Medicare cost report. And this is for cost reporting periods ending on or after January 1, 2021. Um, uh, this is a part of my cost report. I'm uh, giving you this information. They had originally proposed it for all third-party payers, but they are settling on just Medicare Advantage. Um, and then to top it off, they have said that we hope to use this information to set the relative weight for MSDRGs going forward beginning in 2024. Um, your BRG relative weights are currently cost-based. They are tied to the resource intensity of the services you provide. I am just concerned that when we start looking at this, what CMS is going to find is most providers have contracted with Medicare Plus for Medicare Advantage plans. And therefore, if they start getting this information, they're going to find that they're going to be paying out more, uh, setting the weight to um, your contracted amount as opposed to setting them tied to cost. So we're going to have to see if, you know, they're going to have to get this information before they um, realize that maybe this wasn't a good idea, but we'll see where it goes. We have a proposed rule for outpatient. They are proposing a 2.6% increase in the conversion factor, moving from $80.78 to $83 and almost 70 cents. The outlier Threshold would also increase, making it harder for a case to become an outlier. 
CMS is proposing elimination over three years of the unpatient only list. They are starting this this year by removing 266 musculoskeletal services from inpatient only. Um, this is concerning because now we can no longer rely on, or at the end of this three year period, we can't rely on the, um, the services on the inpatient only list. Therefore, it's okay to admit the patient, even if the physician doesn't expect the patient to be an inpatient for two midnights, um, we wind up having the issue of um, um, more documentation to justify a two midnight expectation for a lot more patients. Um, we also will see these services slowly move off of the, um, they, as they move off of the inpatient only list and can be done on an outpatient basis, they will slowly then move to where they can be done in an ambulatory surgical center. For those of you who are 340B hospitals who continue to fight about the current reimbursement of um, average sales price minus 22.5%, um, CMS is proposing that payment um, for 340B drugs in 2021, the average sales price minus 28.7%. So you're going to take in excess of a 6% re uh, increased reduction in your um, payment for your 340B drug. There is litigation on this. We just don't know how it will be resolved because the first pass, this did lose, um, uh, the American Hospital Association did lose. Um, they continue to um, propose to pay for clinic visits in off-campus provider-based departments at 40% of the OPP. OPPS rate. Uh, again, litigation continues on that issue, but again, um, the AHA was not successful on the first round of litigation here. Um, finally, on the outpatient side, more services would require prior authorization. This would be effective in July of next year. Um, they do propose to um, establish uh, general supervision as the minimum required supervision level for all non-surgical extended duration therapeutic services. Um, that would be, uh, I think, an improvement. Um, moving services, as I mentioned, to the ASC covered procedures list. This year, they would be adding total HIP to that list. And comments on this proposed rule are due October 5th. And um, I urge you to start looking at the impact of this on your hospitals and getting some comments issued. Um, there is a new proposed rule related to physician reimbursement. The major issue here, in my opinion, is the reduction in the conversion factor for physician services. Um, almost an 11% reduction in the uh, conversion factor. However, because the physician fee schedule is budget neutral, you have winners and losers. Um, services payments would go up for E&M visits. Um, I think the area that has the highest uh, increase in re reimbursement is endocrinology and rheumatology. Um, family practice services see about a 13% increase in their reimbursement. But some of those services that are hospital-based and hospital employees, we see about 11% reduction in uh, physician reimbursement for radiology and 8% reduction for anesthesiology. Um, so interventional radiology, about 9% reduction. So you have some providers who will win, some who will lose. I think overall, this is a huge, huge cut in the conversion factor and concerned about where it fits. They are proposing to expand telehealth, adding services that would be covered under Medicare. And uh, a very positive is at least those flexibilities that we have received under the public health emergency would stay in place for at least a year after the end of the public health emergency. If I haven't depressed you enough, let's touch base real quick on appropriate use criteria. Uh, appropriate use criteria is a requirement of uh, the Protecting Access to Medicare Act of 2014. 
And I just want you to know that this will be my only opportunity to give you some good news. Um, this is a requirement that for advanced diagnostic imaging, think CTs, um, 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 MRIs, things like that, that the ordering professional would have to consult a clinical decision support mechanism, a CDSM, prior to the actual order. And that CDSM is going to say for that particular test, for those particular um, symptoms, um, the service that you are ordering is appropriate, is not appropriate, or not applicable. Not applicable essentially means that um, um, there is, you're, you're dealing with that from a no access to the internet, uh, certain rural areas, things like that. Um, there is a requirement, it, you, the original law said that the ordering professional had to consult the CDSM. They have now modified that to say that the CDSM could be consulted by someone who is under the direction of the ordering professional. It doesn't mean that the ordering professional can send a script to you at a hospital and say, you look it up. Um, he does actually have to do that within his office. Um, but when we get into the issue of uh, claims within an emergency situation, emergency services are exempt. However, we don't know what that means. Um, is it only up to the extent of the emergency once the patient is stable and they're in observation? Um, do I have to start getting um, a consulting a CDSM if I'm ordering imaging for that patient? And if so, then who's doing it? Um, is this a physician within the hospital? Probably as a hospitalist. And therefore, yes, this becomes an obligation on hospital staff to do this. Um, you, would have, you are required to report on your hospital outpatient claims and your professional claims, um, the claims for the rendering physician, the CDSM that was accessed and whether it was appropriate or not appropriate. The good news is that this was going to be required um, on all claims as of January 1, 2021. CMS is giving you another test year. They are allowing you until uh, January of 2022 to have this on your claim. Um, it, um, the whole idea behind this is to perhaps look at um, ordering professionals who are more ordering tests that they shouldn't. Um, and make them subject, perhaps make them subject to prior authorization. But in the meantime, this is a lot of work on you and on your hospital. Um, wrapping up, again, my slide, if this isn't enough, let's just give you a couple of more things. There is a proposed rule out from CMS to define reasonable and necessary. I think it will be good to have this, particularly if you can then incorporate in the future contracts the CMS definition of reasonable and necessary, that might um, uh, negate some payers from defining it on their own. Um, for Medicaid disproportionate share funding, we're looking at about four, uh, four, um, four billion dollars that is targeted to be reduced from Medicaid dish um, by December 1st. Um, we do need uh, legislative action to extend this. Again, we would hope that any congressional resolution that they um, do this week or next to extend um, the uh, government from uh, operating um, through at least a period of time would address this, but we're not sure that it will. But that would require that we have some sort of legislation, legislative action before December 1. And I guess the concern here is what in the world is going to happen um, with Congress um, um, after the election, before the election. Um, everything is in such turmoil right now, just concerning in terms of where this is going to take us. And last but not least, one thing I wanted to touch on um, is just to let you know that there was an update to the Medicare Secondary Payer Manual that came out on September 4th. This is change request 11945, transmittal 10342. 
that essentially goes through your MSPQ, your Medicare Secondary Payer Questionnaire, and has done major revisions on the document and the questions that need to be asked. Uh, I urge you to take a look at that, determine whether or not your system needs to be modified so that whether it be a form you're, you're using or an online process, that you um, get the revised questions. Um, the first page of the transmittal where it actually gets into the questions, um, I, you know, I was looking for minor modifications. It begins with, in black, um, the section number model admission questions to ask Medicare beneficiaries. Also in black, it says the following, the rest of the page is red. They have modified that entire page. They have also modified, I would say, 90% of the second page of questions. So make sure you take a look at that and that you are now asking the right questions. This is an effective date of December 7th. So Steve, I turn it to you and your team for questions. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. Great presentation. We do have some questions that have come in and as Chris is pulling those up, People asked about the handouts, and with your permission, Kathy, your presentation, Chris is going to send out to all the people uh, that registered for this webinar, if that's okay. Absolutely. Great. The first question, what is your interpretation of de-identified since you have to post the payer charges? Will it not be obvious? Uh, that you have shown which one is minimum or maximum, isn't this a duplication? It is a duplication of one of your negotiated rates, uh, or actually two, the high one and the low one. Um, but again, think about looking at this from a spreadsheet perspective and the fact that um, um, you have lots of contracts it's going to be obvious you're not going to have to sit there and stare at all of them the other thing and i hate to say this but i'm being spiteful today uh i said on that particular slide that this is expected not to be used by the consumer but by employers insurers other providers etc everybody's going to want to know what is your lowest rate for an mri um, because there and it'll be a quick and dirty look and i think it's I, I don't support that it being there. It should, we should be making it a little bit more difficult, but uh, it is in the final rule that we can, we determine ourselves the de-identified minimum and maximum. So let me, add, well, by the way, the person that asked that question went precisely, thank you for your good response, Kathy. Now, uh, here's another, yeah, here's another question. Do you, have to identify each payer negotiated rate by name. For example, Blue Cross PPO, Blue Cross Open Access, Aetna, Cigna, et cetera. Yes, because you probably have a different rate with each of them. So you Which are going to have to do that. If you have signed, you are going to have to do this. You're going Now, if it's a contract with Indian Health Services, you are exempt, okay? Um, but for, and you, you don't have to do this for Medicaid. Um, this is really going to be for your commercial contracts. But yes, you do have to list them all, column after column after column. Okay. I have a question for you, Kathy. It's been a long time since I worked in a hospital, but I spent the most of my career there. And on one of your slides where you showed, which I know makes logical sense, if you've got an account pending with a collection agency, you can't claim it as bad debt. But here's my concern, because I've had discussions, I'll use that word loosely, with Medicare auditors before. When you pull it back and they come in and you say it's not pending, they go, well, you discontinue the collection efforts too soon, we're going to disallow it. Where is the balancing act between when you turn it over to a collection agency and when you truly determine you've exhausted your collection efforts? Uh, I think you need to have an internal policy on that. How long are you going to leave an account in the collection agency if they're not getting any results? Um, but also, and this is 
the main reason CMS has done everything that they did related to bad debts is because you were being audited um, to a particular standard that was not had not really been promulgated. Um, auditors were using criteria that they had developed. The manual said conflicting information. This is now going through, and with this new rule, um, they will be able to update the manual, and everything should be consistent so that you will be audited based upon Medicare reimbursement manual, um, not what individual auditors at the MAX decide to do. Kathy, that's all the questions we have. So what I thought I would do is give you a final thought or a final nugget of advice for our people on the webinar. We've been on exactly an hour. Terrific job, but I'm going to let you close it out. And thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to do one thing, and I just want you to know, and this might be good news. I don't, you know, again, I don't do good news, but. Um, there is a rule um, on display at the Office for Management and Budget. That means that there is a limited time period for this rule to either be published or pulled um, related to what is called transparency and coverage. And this will be a requirement on the payers to make information available to patients and others related to their contracts and patients' obligations and things like that. Um, that rule was proposed at the same time that the hospital rule came out. Um, they were given a extended comment period, and um, about 20,000 comments were submitted, and now we are actually about to get um, a final rule. We've been looking for a final rule since probably March, and it will be very interesting to see what requirements are now going to be on the payers related to transparency. So that could be some fun reading um, once that is issued. So with that, you have my email address, folks. I am always available. Um, you know, wish again we had done this in person perhaps next year. But again, don't hesitate to reach out to me if I can be of assistance at any time. Thank you so much, Kathy. And everyone, appreciate you being on the webinar today.